Now, once the ship reaches shore, there is this big dog that runs off of it, and that's Dracula. Renfield actually escapes. He goes next door to this mysterious old house, but has recently come under new ownership and has a new tenant. You know, finally gets news on the fate of her dear fiance, Jonathan Harker. He's alive. They also want to get married as soon as possible, and they do. Mina spots Lucy up on the cliff where they usually like to sit, and there seems to be something behind her. Later on in the daytime, she notices that Lucy has two pin prick marks on her neck. Seward can't diagnose her, and then says that he has decided to call in an old mentor of his, Van Helsing. <laughs> Hello world, welcome back to my Trek of Vlog. If this is your first time tuning in, why? This is number four. It says number four in the thumbnail and below. Go back to number one, what are you doing? But welcome, my name is Emerald. I'm vlogging Dracula. We're really in the thick of it now, folks. Today we're covering chapters 10, 11, and 12. And very exciting. I got the best Halloween candy. Candy corn. I know this is like a controversial snack, which I don't know why. I don't know why it's controversial to like things that taste good, but that's okay because the less people that like candy corn in the world, the less people are going to be buying candy corn and the more candy corn bags will be on the shelves for me. Mm -mm 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 and this is a, this is gonna be a really sad video. Some sad stuff happens. Why am I like this? Let's get started. I just try to brighten things up in here. It is very cloudy, potentially rainy. So the vibes are on point, but the lighting is not. So Van Helsing returns to England from Amsterdam to attend to Lucy and he meets up with Seward and gives him a lecture on corn? Lucy has gotten even worse. She's pale, she's gaunt, she's conscious, but she doesn't even have the energy to speak. Van Helsing tells Stewart that she's going to need a blood transfusion. They both have noted that she's had significant blood loss, and since that she doesn't have anything that they could get the medicine for, this is really the only course of action they can take. Arthur happens to arrive right before the transfusion begins. He is very worried about her, and he is more than willing to help out in any way that he can. Even before knowing what's about to happen, he says that he would be willing to give his last drop of blood for her. You might! And so Van Helsing completes the transfusion uh, from Arthur to Lucy. Ironically enough, the Red Cross has been calling me a lot lately, asking me to donate, and I really do want to donate. I've tried to give blood four different times over the course of the last several years, and I've never been able to. I've never qualified. It's that low iron. I told you, it's the low iron. Van Helsing also points out the two marks on Lucy's neck. He's very disturbed by them, and they even are showing to be bruised now, and still not healing. At first, Seward thinks that that might be the injury that caused her blood loss, but then he reasons, well, that can't possibly be the case because if she was losing blood out of her neck, then they would see it. Uh, there would be blood stains on her bed or her clothing or even her body. Dracula must be a very clean, oh, I don't want to say this, but I think I kind of have to slurber. I would say six times out of ten, I spilled my drink on myself. I eat popcorn like a horse. The fact that he's able to keep his, uh, I hate this, I hate talking about this. The fact that he's able to be relatively clean, I think is impressive. So Van Helsing orders Seward to watch Lucy all night. He said it is very important that he does not fall asleep, that he has to keep a close eye on her, and he will be back soon, and then they will see. Seward asks him what he means by this, and Van Helsing only answers, we shall see. Very ominous, very dramatic. When Lucy wakes up after the transfusion, she looks much better, she feels much better. She does tell Seward that she's still afraid to go to sleep because she's been having just fitful sleep, disturbing dreams, as you can imagine, but he promises to protect her, and... 
with him at her side all night, watching out for her. Everything goes great. There are no incidents in the night. He returns the next night to also watch her again, but this time Lucy won't let him stay up. She wants him to get some sleep, and she sets him up on a couch in the next room and says that she'll just call if she needs him. And Stuart thinks, yeah, if she needs him, she'll just give him a call, and that'll be fine. <sighs> it was not fine. Lucy writes cheerfully in her journal before she goes to sleep, just thankful for the help of the men around her. And the next morning, Van Helsing has to wake Seward up. He gets there before Seward's even awake. And they go into Lucy's room and find that the poor girl is bad again. She's so bad that they don't even know if she's alive at first, but thankfully she is. And then they perform another blood transfusion, this time with Seward donating the blood. I guess Lucy has AB blood and is a universal receiver because both blood transfusions go off without a hitch and no side effects. It's really weird to me that blood has types. Like, I guess we have different types of hair, different types of eyes, but we don't have different types of organs. Not like this type A liver, type B liver, you know what I mean? Like that. When did they first realize that there were different types of blood? Were there blood transfusions where they were just like, oh yeah, we need blood, so we're going to put this blood in you, and then like people had really bad reactions? And possibly died from the wrong blood like how do they even figure the science amazes me and baffles me like how do they even figure that out that there are different flavors of blood wild man i'm also extremely curious as to how you old blood transfusion works like how 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 i want to watch a video on that how do they do it but i'm afraid to google it after super is done he feels pretty weak, but instead of getting apple juice and crackers, he gets wine. I wish the Red Cross gave me wine. Seward is also just dismayed and confused as to what's going on. I mean, he was in the house all night. As far as he knows, nobody was there. Lucy never called for him. He's just completely flabbergasted. He stays by Lucy's side and after the transfusion, she seems better and doesn't seem to be bothered. Her mom is also there and she makes jokes with Seward about how he needs someone to take care of him and how he needs a wife and it is awkward. Ben Helsing, probably a little distrustful of Seward, says that he's gonna keep an eye on Lucy tonight, but it's also better at least to have like two of them there to, you know, take turns. I think Ben Helsing also continues to talk pretty vaguely. Which again, I get it's very extreme to talk about suspicions when it comes to mythical creatures, but I feel like he needs to start looping Seward in, especially like because it's supernatural, because Seward just thinks it's a normal illness and Van Helsing kind of at this point knows it's not. Supernatural problems require supernatural solutions. You can't just be in the next room. You gotta be in there because that bat at the window is not just a bat. I'm just saying, like, if I was in this book, I think everybody would be fine. <laughs> the next day, Lucy is even better. And then Van Helsing receives some garlic bulbs, which I'm assuming he ordered on Amazon, and instructs Lucy to keep them around herself and around her bedroom, on her bed, by the window, just garlic everywhere. The latest decorating bed. Lucy thinks he's kidding because, I mean, what else is your reaction supposed to be if somebody tells you to keep garlic around your neck and your bedroom? Van Helsing, I guess not a joker. His response is, no trifling with me. I never jest. There is grim purpose in all I do, and I warn you, they do not thwart me. He then rubs the house down with garlic, puts a wreath of garlic around Lucy's neck, and tells her, do not open the window. And to her credit, Lucy takes all this very well. She's very trusting of Van Helsing and Seward. She's very thankful for their help. She knows that obviously whatever they're doing when they're there after the operations and them staying with her, she feels better, so she's you know, I got some evidence and I just really admire her taking this all in stride because I don't know, if, if somebody was telling me <laughs> to sleep with a bunch of garlic around my neck, I, I, I don't know, I, I would be suspicious 
I would probably complain, but Lucy's a champ. She doesn't complain. And that is the end of chapter 10. Now we're in chapter 11. Also, again, starts off with a Lucy diary entry. And it, she's just, again, writing about how, how grateful she is for the help and how she is actually getting used to the garlic. And this is her end of the night. And then the next morning, Seward and Ben Helsing show up back at the house and they're greeted by Mrs. Westenra. She says that she's already gone to visit Lucy that morning and things seem to be fine with her. And the guys are like, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Shoo. And then this is just Denra makes another comment that Lucy is doing better in part because of her. And the guys are like, oh, uh, why? What do you mean by that? And then this is just Denra says, oh, well, I went in in the middle of the night to check on her and the room was just so stuffy and smelled of garlic and that couldn't possibly do her any well. So I opened the window and took out all the garlic. And now this is uh, more irony. Like, I don't want to say this is outright funny because obviously uh, this woman wound up hurting her daughter unintentionally. I don't know, it reads very haughty the way that she says it. Like, oh, she was stuck in that stuffy room with all that garlic and I helped her out and I'm such a great mom. And she basically is like, you're welcome, gentlemen. And unknowing that she's actually done something terrible. <laughs> So it's not funny, it's not humorous, I'm not laughing at this woman harming her daughter. It's just the irony of it. And Van Helsing is very distraught by this. He actually goes into another room and sobs and just breaks down. And he is very upset by this. And he's like, I can't tell her she could have potentially had her daughter killed because of this. But he pulls it together and he tells Mrs. Wistangara just to please do not mess with anything during the night, like they have things set up for very specific reasons. The garlic has medicinal purposes and they perform another blood transfusion, this time Van Helsing giving the blood. I hope they are disinfecting these tools when they're done with them. The narrative then jumps four days later. Things progress as normal. Lucy spends the night with the window closed, garlic close to her all and all around, and things are fine. No more blood transfusions. Her help is slowly coming back to her. Also, Van Helsing has been spending the night at her side because at this point, it's become very apparent that he cannot leave anything to chance. Then we start to read an article that was written about an escaped wolf in the neighborhood. And basically the reporter is talking about how he visits the suit keeper who is like the Joe Exotic of wolves to discuss with him the recent breakout from the zoo. Basically what happened is one of the wolves in the zoo had started acting aggressively, which was out of its nature. I guess it, because it was a zoo animal, it's been pretty docile. The zookeeper also reports that there was a strange gentleman around the wolves. A guy with red eyes. And of course, it's Dracula. They really need some color contacts. Like, the red is a dead giveaway for suspicion. And he's just being generally creepy, which is, of course, his nature, and says to the zookeeper, these wolves seem to be upset, and the zookeeper, uh, like a legend. I don't know if it's funnier that he says this to a, to a person who he thinks is just a regular man, <laughs> or the fact that he says this to demonic creature of the night, Dracula, but after he says, oh, the wolves seem upset at something, his response is, oh, maybe it's you. And then later on in the night, he finds that the cage is empty, the wolf has escaped. But as the interview comes to an end, the reporter then says the wolf comes back. The zookeeper is worried about the wolf because it has shards of glass on it, and he's just like, oh, the poor thing must have just gotten into something it shouldn't have. And that ends that article. We jump back to the sanatorium where Renfield attacks Seward with a knife. He succeeds in cutting him before Seward is able to incapacitate him. As he's being dragged from the room, Redfield actually tries to lick up blood that has stripped from Seward's wound that is now on the carpet. But We then see a telegram where Van Helsing, who has had to return to Amsterdam, is urging Seward to go to Lucy's house and spend the night with her because he can't. Unfortunately, the telegram gets lost in travel and arrives a whole day late. We then take a quick jump back in time to the night that Seward 
was intended to be there for and what poor Lucy experienced. And buckle up because this is a lot. Lucy has trouble sleeping. She's awake in the middle of the night and there is a bat that is repeatedly pounding up against the window. There's a wolf howling somewhere and it's just not the best sleeping conditions. Her mom comes in to comfort her and as they're sitting there together all of a sudden the wolf crashes through the window that's how it got the shards of glass on it now if you remember lucy's poor mother only has a few weeks left to live because her heart is giving out and having a freaking wolf jump through your window you were such a fright that she unfortunately passes away right there poor poor woman lucy is absolutely terrified i mean goodness how could you not be the moonlight starts to start doing weird things and of course this is the same stuff that Harker saw back in the castle and then Lucy just blacks out. Later on the maids rush in and wake her up and now the wolf is gone and they cover her mom up. Lucy puts the garlic flowers on her mom because it's the only thing she can think of to do. She tells the maids to go have a drink of wine to calm down in the dining room. And then Lucy is waiting for them to come back and they never do. And so she goes looking for them and finds the maids in the dining room passed out because they drank drugged wine. Now, I I'm not sure what happens here because Lucy notes there's a bottle of a sedative that is empty and it had been prescribed to her mom from her doctor. So I don't know if Mrs. Fustenra just dumped the whole sedative into the wine and that was like her night night drink because I can't imagine if Dracula had been in the house he wouldn't have needed the wolf to you know crash through the window and such right he could have just went right up from there so I don't really understand completely what happened but my guess is just that it was Mrs. Fustenra had drunk the wine but why would you drug wine was it her own private stash I don't know I, I really I don't know but uh, the maids are asleep. Lucy then goes into her bedroom with her mom and just hides there and prays for peace. She writes all this, this whole account down, but then hides the paper in her the, her pocket with the hopes that if she doesn't survive the night, at least somebody will find it on her and know what happened. And that's the last we hear from her. And just so sad. Poor Lucy doesn't deserve this. Maybe she does. We don't really know her that well. But you know what? She's Mia's best friend and I trust Mina's judgment. So I stick with my original statement. Poor Lucy doesn't deserve this. And that brings us into our final chapter of the day, chapter 12. We then pick up where we left off with Seward, where he has gotten the telegram and he's rushing over. It's the following morning and Van Helsing actually meets in there. And together they figure out how to break into the house because no, nobody's answering the door. They find the maids still passed out from drugs. And then they find Lucy and her mom in the bedroom. They are saddened to see that unfortunately Lucy's mom has passed on, but Lucy is actually still breathing. And so they spring into action. They wake the maids, they try to get Lucy warm, they put her in a hot bath. During this time, a guest comes, but they tell the maids to shoo them away. And then Seward makes a comment about how they're fighting death. And Van Helsing remarks that they are doing more than that. And that if it were only death that they were dealing with, then he would let Lu poor Lucy just pass on peacefully. Which Seward is kind of confused by. Then they leave the room. They're going to prepare for another transfusion. They're trying to figure out which one of them is going to do it. Van Helsing remarks that they're both weak, but it's been a few days. Like, oh, come on guys, you can rally. Also, they have the maids there. But Van Helsing remarks that he doesn't trust them. And uh, first of all, rude. Second of all, beggars can be choosers, Abe. But by a twist, as they're discussing this, somebody interrupts them, and it's the guest from before who has not gone away. And it is our old yeehaw friend, Quincy Morris. Art had apparently telegrammed him saying he hasn't heard from anybody in days and urged him to go visit the house to check on Lucy. Quincy's a pretty loyal guy, so he decided to stick around until he could talk to somebody, which is nice and in this case helpful, but also if somebody tells you to leave the house, you gotta leave the house, dude. Americans. 
And Quincy's eager to help, and they perform the transfusion, this time with him. They see signs of Lucy improving, but not as strongly as before, and it's then that they find the diary entry, and they are perplexed by the horrors that Lucy described. Now is really the time where Van Helsing should explain at least to Seward, maybe not Quincy, because Quincy hasn't witnessed it all, but he needs to fill him in. Like, it's gotten to the point, Lucy's this close to death, you know that there's a fear that she might turn into a vampire, like, he hinted at it before. Like, you gotta keep your team in the loop, Abraham. They make arrangements for Mrs. Wistenra to have an undertaker come and take her. And they also telegram Arthur, filling him in on the basics of what's happened, that Lucy's taken a turn for the worse and that her mom has passed away. Quincy questions, ooh, it's hard to say, say that five times fast, Seward on everything that's happened to sort of fill in the gaps that he's missed. Seward's kind of hesitant because he doesn't know how much Van Helsing wants Quincy to be in the know. Quincy basically asks him right out if Seward and Hel Van Helsing and Arthur have all done the transfusion process previously and Seward confirms it. Seward also tells Quincy that they have been unable to figure out what is causing all this blood loss. Lucy then wakes up and she is understandably distraught about her mom. Throughout the rest of the day and night, Seward and Van Helsing stay by her side and Quincy patrols the grounds. We love to see teamwork. Lucy still looks pretty sick, again not improving as much as before after the transfusions and Seward even observes that her teeth seem to be getting longer. Uh -oh. And her sleep is not peaceful. Arthur then arrives and Lucy perks up a bit at his presence, but Seward is still not positive about the outlook. And poor Arthur is just so distraught. I mean, his father's passed away. The love of his life is in jeopardy on her deathbed, basically. And poor guy's just having a rough time. Everyone's having a really rough time. We then see a letter that Mina writes to Lucy, and it's kind of heartbreaking. It's been two weeks since the two have corresponded. Mina and John have returned to England to Exeter. Parker's boss, uh, Hawkins, the same guy that he wrote to while in the castle, has invited the Harkers over for dinner. He also remarks at the dinner that he has known them since childhood, which I found surprising. Like, I want to know more about this. How did this boss guy know both of them since childhood? I guess Mina and Harker have known each other since childhood. That's kind of sweet. But I want more backstory on this because I thought this guy was just Harker's boss. I guess they all grew up in that town and villages were small back then, so he just knew them around town. I don't really know. I, I don't know. Also, Hawkins, who doesn't have any children or a family, tells them both that he is leaving them everything in his will. So his house and his fortune and the Harkers are moved by this and just so grateful. At least somebody's getting positive news here. Hawkins also asks the Harkers to live with him and they accept. And uh, where were they living before? Like, where, where were their houses? Where were they staying? I, um, more questions. Harker is also made a partner at the firm. Yay for him. Mina writes that she desperately wants to visit Lucy, but she just can't get away at the moment because Harker still needs her there to take care of him. He's still waking up in the night at times with bad dreams. He doesn't have his health fully back. And Mina also asks Lucy some questions about the wedding, which, again, just kind of sad. One of Seward's colleagues from the asylum writes to him about Renfield. He reports that there were two people who came to the sanatorium looking for Carfax. Oh, that's right. I forgot to mention the house that's next door that Dracula bought. The name, because all, I guess, Manson's had names back then is Carfax, like the website with the annoying little fox. Do with that information as you will. Uh, apparently Renfield yelled at these two workers from his window and cursed at them and the, one of the workers yelled back and they got into like a little shouting match. The doctor then goes up to confront Renfield about it and be like, well, what was that about, dude? Renfield claims that he doesn't even remember it happening. Then breaks out again. This hospital needs stronger bars on the windows or something. At this point, the workers who are looking for Carfax are now taking some of the wooden boxes of dirt 
out of the house and Renfield attacks them. He nearly kills one of the guys and winds up breaking the other guy's finger. He claims that he's fighting for his master. I guess he just is really set off by the idea of people touching Dracula's stuff and going into his house. And these men actually threaten to sue the hospital for letting this patient escape and for their injuries. But they also claim that if they had been so tired from looking at the boxes of dirt, then they, they could have taken that. And it's like, yeah, bro, you, you just caught us on like a really rough day. We were really tired and really thirsty. It was really hot in that house, but we could have still taken him. And I just like to imagine that these guys are named Brad and Chad. Like we actually do learn their names, but I don't care about that. Their names are Brad and Chad. Mina again writes to Lucy, this time with sad news of her own, that poor Mr. Hawkins has passed away. She also writes that she saw him as a father figure because she was an orphan. And again, I'm like, what is the backstory here? It seems like there is a rich history of them as children and this man who then became Hargreaves' boss. And like, why, Stoker? Why give us all these little intriguing nuggets, uh, but then not give us any information on it? He could have just been Harker's boss, but no, he's apparently a pseudo father figure. I need to know the lore. I need to know the backstory. Jonathan is also very sad about this and he's grieving, but also very worried. He's just been recently made a partner and now he's kind of got to do it alone. He's having doubts about himself and just questioning whether he's going to be able to do this. And I do feel very bad for him. I'm also very grateful that he can't see what I've been saying about him. And Mina is just trying to bolster his confidence and assure him that she has the utmost belief in him. Since Hawkins is to be buried in London, Mina tells Lucy that she will try to make the trek over to visit her. We then go back to Seward's diary. They're trying to get Arthur asleep, who also is still in mourning, and as you can imagine, it's very hard for him to leave Lucy's side, so he's kind of resisting sleep. Basically, I have to force him to leave the room and go lay down. Van Helsing has put more garlic all around the room in the house. Again, Seward notes that Lucy's teeth are longer and Sharper. He also observes a kind of strange, repetitive behavior that Lucy does. When Lucy is awake, she holds the garlic close, but when she's asleep, she pushes it away. The biggest shock, however, Van Helsing and Seward notice that the two puncture wounds on Lucy's neck, which have remained pretty much the same for the past two weeks, have suddenly healed overnight. Both men are completely surprised, and Van Helsing is also nervous. And he says that this is confirmation that Lucy is near death. They wake up Arthur so that he can say proper goodbye. Lucy is happy to see him when he comes in the room, but Van Helsing tells Arthur not to give her a kiss. Lucy falls asleep, so we're observed slight change in appearance while asleep. And when she wakes back up, she beckons Arthur to come closer to her and to give her a kiss. But Van Helsing pulls him back and jumps in between them like a chaperone at a middle school dance. And Lucy is very angry about this change in behavior. A nerd Seward, she once again falls back asleep. And then when she wakes up, she seems to have returned back to normal. And she actually calls Van Helsing her friend and asks him to guard Arthur. Realizing that she has kind of flipped back to normal Lucy, Van Helsing allows Arthur to give her a kiss on the forehead as a final goodbye. And then he draws him away. Lucy falls back asleep. Her breathing eventually stops. And that's the unfortunate end of Lucy with Senra. <sighs> Moment of silence. Arthur breaks down and leaves the room. Seward observes that even though she is now passed away, the color seems to be coming back to Lucy's face, which is weird. As he stands with Van Helsing, Seward remarks that at least she is now in peace and, quote, it is the end, unquote. Van Helsing's response is not so. It is only the beginning. And that brings us to the end of today's video. On Friday, we will pick back up with chapters 13, 14, 15. Things are really in the thick of it now. I will say that this is where the plot really starts to kick in. We've had our first major character of death. This will drive our characters even harder and it's about to get real. Tune in on Friday and thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your Monday and bye.